All right, so James for Beginners, uh, Practical Christianity. This is lesson number seven in this series and the title of this lesson is Prescription for Worldliness. Uh, and if you're following along in your Bibles, it's James chapter four. And uh, hopefully we'll be covering verses one to 10. Little review, get us into uh, tonight's material. Uh, after having warned the church, his readers, about how to discern between good and bad teachers, last time that's what we talked about, you know, how, how do you know you have a good teacher versus a bad teacher? And so he was talking about that uh, last time. And the conclusion we came to was, uh, good teachers produce good things in their students by drawing upon heavenly wisdom, which is already evident in themselves. So James leaves off speaking about teachers and he does a kind of a spiritual checkup of his readers as we move into cha uh, to, uh, chapter four. So he was talking about those who were teaching them and how they could you know, discern which are the good ones, which are the bad ones. And then he kind of narr you know, he narrows down, now not talking about the teachers anymore, he's talking about the students, he's talking about the members of the church uh, to whom he is uh, uh, writing. So uh, uh, he's, going to, uh, he's going to diagnose them, a kind of a spiritual diagnosis about their spiritual condition. And then after reviewing their symptoms and diagnosing their illness, their spiritual illness, uh, he gives not only a prognosis for the future for those with the spiritual illness that they have, he also provides them with a spiritual prescription uh, that will bring healing, spiritual healing for the problems that they are suffering. That's why we're calling this lesson Prescription for uh, Worldliness. So let's uh, begin reading as James performs this spiritual checkup. When we read chapter four, verse one a, he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? And we'll stop right there because there's the, there's the diagnosis if you wish. Uh, he describes what the wisdom from below, remember he was talking about teachers who were drawing on wisdom from above and those who were drawing wisdom from below. So he describes what the wisdom from below that they have been feeding on is producing in them. The symptoms of an unhealthy, an unhealthy body, spiritual body. Now, the right teaching with the right motives and a sincere response produces a different result than what they are experiencing. However, when reviewing the symptoms of his readers, James notes that the fruit of their conduct is negative and destructive. So in the next section, he goes on to, as I say, to further his diagnosis of the problem, and we'll see what the problem is. Now, he's going to look for the cause. So the problem is they're quarreling. There's division and he's saying that's because you've been feeding on the wisdom from below, probably being taught to you by teachers who are drawing on this kind of wisdom in order to, uh, in order to teach you. So let's look for the cause. Uh, the symptoms are war, strife, fighting in the church. Verse 1b says, is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? So James begins by noting that uh, it is a pleasure for the flesh to want its own way and thus continue quarreling and dividing among the members uh, of the body in order to obtain it. There's the problem, he says, getting one's way no matter what the damage or cost. And um, um, uh, he is suggesting that people uh, fight over worldly things uh, using worldly tactics, and in the end, things are usually worse, no matter who wins. I mean, that's true in the world, that's true in the church, that's true in a, uh, in a school, even in a family, right? If all we do is fight and, and, and divide and, and, and we just up the ante, what's the natural result of this? Well, it, it can't be good, and that's what he's saying to them. You fight, you quarrel, there's division, and you continue to do so in order to get what you want. And so his kind of rhetorical question is, what do you think this kind of activity is going to produce? It's not going to produce anything, anything good. So in verse 2a he says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. So here's how wars begin. You know, they begin with quarrels, right? There are quarrels that continue and continue and you know, become aggravated and grow. You know, they grow into wars eventually. 
And he says to them, you desire but cannot obtain. And so a lot of people say, well, what are they desiring? You know, money? No, in this case, what they're desiring is to get their own way. That's what they're desiring. You war, but you cannot obtain what? Your own way. Um, so what do you do if you can't get your own way? Well, you continue to quarrel, you continue to go to war, you continue to divide. In verse two B and three he says, you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's a little bit of uh, you know, misunderstanding here if you think that they're envious. We always think people are envious because you know, oh, they want what they have, you know, money, uh, you know, a nice car, or a beautiful watch. You know, they're, they're thinking this is the kind of, when they read this, hmm, you're envious and cannot obtain, right? But he says the quarrels and the wars and divisions begin and continue because of the things you desire. They're not spiritual things, they're worldly things. Well, what are the worldly things that these people were desiring? Well, power. Who is in charge? And honor among men. And selfish ambition. Who's going to be first? Who's going to boss who around? Who's going to get their own way? These are the things that they were envious of. These were the things that they were fighting over and competing with one another. Now, he's saying these things here, they, they appeal to the flesh not to the spirit. You know, James says they don't receive what? Well, they don't receive spiritual things because they don't ask for these kinds of things. Well, what kind of thing? Well, humility, peace of mind, graciousness, the ability to forgive, a more expansive heart to be able to love. These are spiritual things. And he's saying, you're not asking for these kind of things, so you're not receiving these kind of things. And he says to them, you would rather fight over worldly things. Well, what are the worldly things? Well, it's, in this case, it's not money or, no, no, the worldly things is who's in charge? Who will receive the, you know, the attention of everyone or the, 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 the applause of everyone? Whose word will be listened to? These are the things that you want. And these things, he says, these are not heavenly things. They're not things that come from above. They're not gifts, uh, the type of gifts that God gives to men. That's, those are not the type of things. And actually God is not going to give them these type of things even if they ask for them. You know, people rarely argue and compete over spiritual matters. It's usually fleshly matters that they fight and quarrel over. I'll give you an example. You know, I've, been, I've been a minister for more than 37 years. And in all that time I've never seen a debate over the mop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Over the mop. In other words, no one competes over who will get to the church building first on Saturday morning to mop up the floors in the bathroom. I've never seen two people, you know, say, no, you give me the mop. No, I want the mop. Well, you, you mopped up the bathroom last week. I want to be able to do it. No, I've never seen an argument like that. Nobody fights over those type of things. Service, humble service. Uh, I've never seen brethren fighting over who will visit the sick and shut in. I've never seen two deacons you know, going back and forth. Listen, you've been to visit the sick and the shut in you know, and bringing them communion you know, on, on Sunday afternoon. You've done that for three weeks. It's my turn. Let me do it. No, no, I want to do it. And they're fighting back and forth over the communion kit. <laughs> I've never seen two people you know, fight over that. People do not compete over who will give more for the offering. I've never seen any of the deacons fighting with one another over the privilege of locking down the building after services. That's not usually the attitude I see. Usually it's like, oh, it's my month. Oh man, I, gotta, I have to stay late. You know? I have to wait till everybody's gone before I can lock up and go home. Not always, but sometimes that's the attitude. But I've never seen deacons fighting over the privilege of doing that that particular chore. You know, we rarely argue and fight over the pursuit of heavenly things like personal purity or service to the church or preaching and teaching the word. Nobody fights over those type of things. The things we fight over are things from below. You know, who receives personal honor? 
Who gets privilege? Who exercises power? Those are, those are things from below. And we pursue these fleshly things with methods and tactics from below, quarreling, division, because these things satisfy that part of our nature which is from below. Things like pride or lust for control or selfishness. So this is the point that, that James is, is saying here. You, you quarrel and fight over things which are from below. You don't ask God for things that are from above and so obviously He won't give them to you. And even if you asked Him for the things that you want which are from below, He wouldn't give them to you anyways. Why? Because they would simply serve your flesh and actually exacerbate the problem that is taking place. All right, so now he's going to give a, a prognosis. You, know, a progno you go see the doctor, he does the tests, he makes a diagnosis, he tells you what's wrong with you, and then he gives you the prognosis. So here's the prognosis. Well, you, know, you have a, a, a mass on your kidney, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to remove it, and you have a 90% chance of success. You know, you know, or uh, you've got stage four cancer, and uh, there's not much we can do for you. We give you three months you know, to live, the, the, the prognosis. So he's going to give them the prognosis. So briefly, let's review what we have so far. A, the symptom, quarreling, division, trouble. The diagnosis is you're desiring things from below and you're using tactics from below in order to acquire these things. So he says in these verses, he'll give a prognosis, an opinion as to what this problem will result in. And how long does the patient have to live? You know, and can he recover? So we read in uh, uh, verse 4, A, he says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So he compares this type of conduct to adultery. In other words, here's what's really wrong with you. You're committing adultery, not sexual adultery. The idea is that these Christians are unfaithful to Christ when they act in this way. Then in 4b he says, therefore whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So this behavior, he says, is a sign of increasing friendship with the world. There's your prognosis. There's your illness. Let's put a, let's put a name on your illness, okay? Well the name of your illness is you are you're stopping being a friend of God and you're starting to be a friend of the world. So whoever uh, identifies himself as a friend of the world in this way makes himself an enemy of God. All right. So in verse five he says, or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. In other words, God is serious about what He says in the scriptures. The Spirit of God within us is jealous when we make friends with the world instead of pursuing and developing our friendship with God. And in this regard, I want to read another scripture, but not in James. So if you're following your Bible, just stay, keep a finger in James. And let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. He says, in that particular epistle, Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Sealed for the day of redemption. You know, in Acts 2.38, um, uh, Luke writes that Peter preaches, you know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within us. Well, what's the significance of that gift? Well, Paul answers that in Romans chapter 8, and um, he, I paraphrase here, but he's saying, if the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if that Spirit that indwelled Him and that you know, raised Him from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you as well, then that spirit will raise you from the dead in the same way that he rose Jesus from the dead. There's the significance of having the indwelling of the spirit, like the end game of having the spirits through the power of the spirit that were raised from the dead. 
And so he can, I continue in Ephesians 4, he says, so there's the seal for the day of redemption, okay? We're sealed by the Spirit. We're given the Spirit to guarantee that we'll resurrect okay, on the day of redemption. Then he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Well, in this particular passage in Ephesians, Paul is describing actually what's taking place with the people that James is talking about. What's going on with them? Well, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and, and malice, those are the things that are happening among them. So Paul warns his readers about this and James does exactly the same in the book of James. So we go back to James verse six, he says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so picking up our line here, you know, you're, don't ask for God for things from below, ask God for things from above. So he says, God, however, through this same spirit, rewards with grace and blessings those who resist these fleshly temptations to pride and selfishness and ambition and so on and so forth. Those who resist these type of things, God will bless them. Those who resist these type of things by humbling themselves before God and humbling themselves before their brethren, what will happen? Well, he says, God will lift them up and they will also receive the respect of their brethren. You know, <laughs> isn't it, isn't it you know, the, the, the most common thing that we, that we experience when we talk about someone we admire? Uh, just take sports figures, for example. You know, you're watching TV and they're doing a, a thing about a, a famous sports figure, some individual in some area of sports, and, and they're complimenting him. And when they're complimenting this sports figure, man or woman, and they're talking about their ability you know, that they show in their sport, but then when they start talking about that person's character, what's the thing that, you know, the thread that runs through all of these great sports figures admired by people. They say, yeah, and, and he's such a humble guy. He's helpful and he's a team leader and he's, you know, he's there, he's generous. You know, he you know, doesn't hog the ball, for example. Isn't that the same thing they say about anybody, any great person that they admire? Always this idea, yeah, and they're so humble, they're not full of themselves, right? That's what we admire in people. I've never heard anybody say, oh, I admire that, 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 that athlete so much because he's always shooting off his mouth. <laughs> because he's always bragging on himself. Uh, because he's selfish. He doesn't you know, participate with the team. We never hear anybody praise someone for that kind of behavior. We never hear other humans uh, raise up an individual who acts like a, like a jerk. No, usually it's somebody that, that shows humility and generosity and kindness. That, that's what appeals to people. So that's what, that, that's what James is saying, is saying here. Not only will you be raised up by, by God, but you'll be raised up by the brethren as well, as an example, as someone that they admire, someone they might want to follow. And so the point here, <clears throat> excuse me, the point here and James's prognosis is that a Christian cannot be friends with the world, meaning desiring worldly things and then acquiring them using worldly tactics. So a person can't be a friend of the world and then be friends with God, meaning desiring spiritual things and obtaining them through spiritual methods. A person cannot be both at once. That's what he's saying. You can't be both things at once. You, you can be one or the other, but you cannot be both at once. And, and, and you know, J, uh, Jesus talks about this, doesn't he? You can't, you can't serve God and mammon. There's always a choice involved. So James's final opinion based on his diagnosis is that division, arguing, unbridled ambition, constant criticism of each other, these are the definite marks of a worldly church, not a church that belongs to Christ. All right, so he moves you know, from, from this position here, from the prognosis, um, to a uh, prescription. Um, James will prescribe three things that must be done in order to become friends with God and therefore cure this illness of worldliness that this church is suffering. 
All right, three things. Number one, he says, make your choice. Verse 7a. He says, submit therefore to God. Christians in trouble, in a slide away from Christ and into division and conflict, they need to take a stand. That choice is a firm decision to come under God's rule once and for all. Stop going back and forth. Usually you know, Christians, you know, when they're having problems in their spiritual life, they're not all in the worldly camp. You know, they're in the worldly camp and for some things and some activities and some type of thinking and then they're in the spiritual side for other type of things. They tend to go back and forth. And so James is saying, come on, make your choice once and for all. So for non-Christians making that choice, making that choice means a positive response to the gospel. That's making a choice. And we know for non-Christians making, you know, making a choice means hearing and believing that Jesus is the divine Son of God. You believe it or don't you believe it? You know, somewhere along the line you have to say, you know, there's enough evidence, I've read enough to convince me that this is true. That when I'm thinking about Jesus, I'm seeing the Son of God in fleshly form. You know, make a choice what you believe. And then repenting or turning away from things that come from below and focus on the things that are above because that's one of the things Jesus says to His disciples. They need to repent. They need to stop you know, living by the power of the things that are below and start living by the power of the things that are from above. Sometimes it's, it, they're simple things like you know, giving up a bad habit. You know, maybe you're a smoker or maybe you, know, you, you, you consume pornography. You know, some things are kind of simple to see. You start just unloading bad habits that, are come from, that, that, that come from the world. Others are more subtle. You know, maybe too big an ego, a little too puffed up in pride. You know, that has to go also, that, that character reformation has to, has to begin as well. That's, the, that's part of repentance. And then of course acknowledging your faith in Christ to others. I believe it and I'm not afraid to acknowledge it. And then being baptized, meaning being immersed in the water. Uh, and doing so in the name of Jesus and the Godhead for the forgiveness of sin and to receive this gift, this indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you. So for people who are not Christians, make your choice once and for all. And so the, for the non-Christian, the first mark of submission to God is to obey all of these, to confess Christ, to repent of sin, to be baptized. You know, some people say, well, I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'm going to start making an effort to live you know, a better life. But baptism, well, you know, that's not necessary. You know, it's just a ceremony. I can do without it. There's no magic in the water. The only power that baptism has is that it's been given by God to man in order to do. There's the power of it. We've been asked to do this by God to complete our full submission to Him in faith. It's an expression of our faith demanded by God. Okay? So a lot of people, you know, they, they won't do that. Well, if they don't do that, they are not in full submission to God. Again, make a choice. Are you going to obey fully or not? Neglecting one voids the rest because we have refused to submit to God's word about salvation. Same thing with repentance. Yeah, I believe Jesus, uh, Jesus is the Son of God and okay, I'm going to be baptized, but I'm going to continue to consume pornography because I like it. Or I'm going to continue to, be, uh, you know, to use anger in order to manipulate and threaten other people. That's going to be my stick that I use in my personal relationships to get my way. So you know, you, 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 you've done the, the faith part, you've done the baptism part, but you haven't done the repentance part, not sincerely. You see, what I, this is what I'm trying to say here. Make a choice, he says, make a choice. No matter what the situation, I put myself always back into God's hands. And I need to do this because I have a habit of trying to take control of my own life. Some people are like that. You know, they do all of that and then they go back to living their life according to their own thinking. Make a choice. If you choose Christ and you submit to Christ, then you have to submit to Him every day. Don't take back your life. 
So in the cure for worldliness, James prescribes first and foremost that we make a choice once and for all of who we are. And if that choice is that we are Christians, then we should act like Christians with wisdom and conduct from above. That's his point. Number two in the cure, make a stand. Let's read verse 7b. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So make a stand or make a defense against the devil. You know, a lot of people fall or are led away from Christ because of several things. Because they play around with sin. They're curious about sin. They're curious about, well, what would it be like if I did this? Or what would happen? And you know, surely God's not going to punish. You know, they, they play around with sin. They're not serious about, no, I'm not doing this thing. No, this is a bad thing. This can lead me to other things. Or they take their time with sin. Well, just this once. You know? Well, oh, the, the, the one that is really dangerous is, well, if it gets worse, or if I get caught, then you know, I'll stop it. I'll just, I'll just try to keep it under the radar. I'll just you know, play close to the line. You know? And if I get caught or something happens, okay, that'll be it. And then something happens and what do we do? Well, okay, next time. I mean, if, if this happens, you know, we, just, we, we just keep parlaying our denial. I call it parlaying our denial. Our denial. Rolling over our denial till the next time something bad, uh, something bad happens. Uh, happens. Um, or it's a problem but I'll deal with it tomorrow or when I feel like it or when the time is right or when there's a new moon, you know, putting it off till later. Or people mistakenly believe that God doesn't think this sin is really serious and won't really punish me for it. That was the original lie in the garden. Isn't that what the devil said to Eve? Really? Is God really? Has he really said this? That you will die? If you eat, you will die? Come on. Just a, just a fruit. What's the big deal? And it's good for you. We continue to believe that lie. God really won't punish me for this. You know, uh, uh, people who are involved in an adulterous relationship, you know, they got their spouse at home, but they got this you know, partner on the side, male or female, whatever. And in their mind they're saying, but I love this person. You know, it can't be bad if I love this person. And this person is such a nice person and they make me happy and they make me feel good and the sex is great. You know I mean? How can this be bad? Well, it's bad because God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what makes it bad, no matter how you feel. See, that's what people do. They go into denial. They start thinking, wow, God, certainly he wouldn't do that. Much more reasonable than that. We have to remember that the devil will remain near and he will continue to find ways to entice you and to give you reasons to give in to sin and offer you promises of pleasure and satisfaction with sin until you do one of two things. So he stays at you all the time until you do one of two things. One, you give in or give in again or two, Make a stand. Resist. Say no. You know, I've said this before myself, if I'm starting to think or do something or you know, down, that, down that aisle you know, or down that road where I know uh -oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble, I, I say it out loud sometimes. No. Nope. <laughs> I scare my wife. <laughs> What are you saying no to? Oh, it's OK, I got it. I got it under control. Or if the thread of a thought starts going through my mind, you know, some evil, ugly thing goes through my mind. And, no, no, stop, stop. You know, just to break the moment. To say out loud to Satan, no, I don't want that. Go away. Make a stand. Satan only flees when you make a stand to resist him. Otherwise, he works away at your indecision until you succumb to him. You know, like a little child is after you all the time. Mommy, mommy, can I go? Can I have a, you know, can I have a cookie? Can I have a cookie? You know, little kids, they only have one thing to do. Is that's to get you know, their parents' attention for whatever for food or for a toy. That's all they got to do. They get up in the morning. Their job is to get onto their mother or dad to you know, listen to them. Well, you know, it's, it's not the perfect parallel, obviously, but you know, Satan's like that too. He's only got one job. That's to make you sin, to lead you into some kind of sin or sinful situation. 
so that you will be condemned and certainly to lead you into disbelief and resistance of the gospel or putting it off. That's his only job. I mean, he's done. He's already defeated. His judgment's already been pronounced. So he's playing a game of attrition here. It's just a game of attrition. How much damage can he do? It's like a, you know, a football team is losing 100 to nothing and they're in the last quarter. And so the team that's got zero points, they can't win the game, but they can, they can do some dirty hits on the quarterback or they can, you know, you know what I'm saying? They can play dirty, maybe injure some players. Attrition. Yeah, you beat us, but we're going to take a pound of flesh. Well, Satan's the same thing. All right, number three. Remember, we're talking about the prescription here. Make a choice, make a stand. Number three, draw near to God. Verses eight to 10, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. you know, if we make a stand against the devil, it will become a first step in drawing closer to God. You know, the thing that separates you from God is sin. Every time you remove a sin out of your life, you've just taken one step closer to God and He a step closer to you in that sense. So James mentions additional steps that one can take in order to draw closer to God. First, uh, he says, let me see, yeah. He says, cleanse your hands. Of course, this is a metaphor that represents a spiritual cleansing. In other words, stop sinning. Work at stop sinning. Ask God to help you deal with the ones you know about and reveal to you the ones you are not aware of. You want a prayer that God will answer? Ask Him, Lord, please reveal to me the sins that I do that I don't even know about. Or, dear God, you know, reveal to me what I'm really like, how you see me. Not how you see me in Christ, he sees you perfect in Christ, but you know, how, how you're able to see my deficiencies and my failings. Show me that so that I can be aware of, my, of myself. Nothing creates more humility in a person uh, than when God exposes that person to themselves. That's a prayer God will answer. Every sin, as I said, we discard and overcome enables us to be one step closer to God. You want to draw closer to God? Start, start working on the sin quota in your life. Secondly, he said, purify your hearts. You know, he's dealt with the impurity that sin causes. Now, in this particular passage, he's talking about purity. Not sexual purity, although that is included in the idea of repentance. No, he's talking about wholeness or integrity of one's heart. In other words, make up your mind once and for all. You know, your heart is pure. It's not divided with two things. Who will you serve? God or the world? Don't be double-minded. If you're going to be a Christian, then don't hold back. Go all out. Don't change your mind in midstream. You know, purify your heart. And then thirdly, sincere repentance. This is how to draw close. You, know, you want to draw closer to God, cleanse your hands, you know, deal with sin, purify your heart, make up your mind, and sincere repentance. Realize that it is your sins that cause Christ's death and your own condemnation. Wake up to its danger. Because sometimes we regret more letting go of the sin than the damage that it has caused in our lives and in the sufferings of Christ. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, oh, it's killing us to let go of this bad habit or this sin. You know, like we're more in, pain, uh, in pain and we mourn more the loss of this sin or getting rid of the, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't do that anymore. Oh, you know, whatever that is. We're more sorry about that then sorry about what it has caused God's son to suffer or sorry for the trouble that it has caused in our lives. You know, if God calls it sin, then we are wise to get rid and stay rid of it, no matter how we you know, think about that thing. So in verse 10, he summarizes the cure for worldliness in our lives and in the church. What does he say? 
draw near to God through faith, repentance, and obedience. Why? Well, he will draw near to you to, to uh, he will draw near to you by giving you pardon for your sins because of your faith, and this pardon will create joy in your heart. You know, if you have faith, the idea is if you have faith and you respond with faith, meaning you confess Christ and are baptized, you know, and you live the Christian life through faith, well, God will forgive you your sins, right? And with the forgiveness of your sins comes joy. How joyful it is to know that you're forgiven. You know, when you're a little kid and you do something wrong and you know, your parents, you know, they ground you or something like that, and they punish you and after everything is over, you know, your dad comes and he sits you on his lap and he gives you a hug. He says, now, you know, daddy didn't want you to do that and you, know, you, you can't play your whatever video games you know, tonight, you know, tomorrow you can do that again. But you know, I still love you. You ever see how little kids, you know, once, the, the, once the punishment's over and once there's reassurance that you know, well, you've been punished, but we love you anyways, how they squeeze, oh, thank you, I love you, daddy, thank you. It's over, you know, that joy that comes from knowing that we're forgiven. Well, it's the same thing. The heavenly Father forgives us and then reassures us that He loves us. That brings joy into our heart. And then He will draw near to you by giving you protection from the evil one, which will give you peace of mind. You know, repentance is not a one-time thing. Baptism is a one. If, you, if you're baptized in the right way, you know, through immersion in water, and baptized for the right reason, you know, because of Christ, because of your faith in Christ, well then, you're protected. You're protected, your sins are forgiven. But that repentance, that repentance is an ongoing thing in your life. I, I repent every day. I'm always looking for ways to repent before God, get rid of stuff. And because of that, God protects me. And that protection gives me peace, protects me in the sense that I understand I'm not perfect, I'm working on that, but I'm not condemned because of my imperfection. See what I'm saying? I have that protection of God's grace over me. As I live my imperfect life doing my best, I know that God's grace is over me. And what does that give me? Well, peace. I'm at peace. I can go to bed at night knowing no matter what happens, if I die in my sleep, you know, I'm going to wake up and be with the Lord. That brings peace. And then, of course, He will draw near to you by restoring His relationship with you as you become His child and He your Father. And this will create zeal in your spirit to serve Him. You know, when we're doing the right thing, when we're obeying God and doing our best to do that, the Father will infuse us with enthusiasm for our faith and for our, for our religion. Such are the rewards given to those who draw near to God. Joy, peace, zeal. Those are the things from above. The things are from, be, from below, you know, the reward from below, oh, power, who gets to boss everybody around, who gets the honor of man, who gets the applause, those are worldly things. Joy and peace and zeal, those are things from above. So James teaches that the cause of conflicts within ourselves and our families and the church is excessive worldliness and the desire for the satisfaction of fleshly things like pride and power and recognition and, and selfish ambition. Christians therefore need to be careful because friendliness to the world is a sign that one is gradually becoming an enemy of God. That's the danger. And the cure that James proposes for this malady is threefold. Take your position with God once and for all. Make your choice. Two, stand firm against the devil. You know, like that old saying, just say no. And three, continually do those things that will serve to draw you nearer to God and further away from the world. One last point I want to make. If you feel that God is far away from you, it's usually because you have drifted away from Him. He doesn't drift away from you. You drift away from Him. He's always there and He never moves away. And He's always calling all of us to draw near to Him through the ways and methods that I've talked about tonight. Okay, so there's the prescription for worldliness. We're going to continue with this series in James next time. Thank you for your attention.